or 53, actually we'll begin in the last paragraph of chapter 52. This is one of the great, or if not the greatest, crowning prophecies in all the Old Testament. In fact, about every phrase, when he said over 85 times that uh, Isaiah 53 is quoted in the New Testament, almost every phrase is used to explain our justification, our redemption, our propitiation, our sanctification, our glorification. And you say, well, wait a minute, those are all big fancy terms. Well, no, those are good old Bible terms that we need to be familiar with. Justification. Of course, we like to use a little uh, uh, hook on that is by justify had never sinned. We are taken, as we see in Romans chapter 3, out of chapter 1 and 2, we're taken into the slave market of sin. We've sold ourselves to the bondage of Satan and how that we have to be brought before the court of God's law to be declared righteous and justified. And so we see that it is God who declares us righteous. But he has to do it because he is the one who pays the price for our sin. And that's where we get redemption. Redemption is the idea of payment, payment for sin. When you redeem something, you pay off the price. And as a result of that, there is propitiation, which means everything is settled, everything is satisfied. And so propitiation, which is used in the New Testament, and for lack of time, I would love to uh, go through each one of these this morning. I was listening to a preacher this past week that I said, I, he's a good Bible expositor. I want to see what he says about this. His message was an hour and 35 minutes long. Well, uh, I'm not sure that you guys want that this morning, so I'll try to be brief. But uh, we see that he says that uh, propitiation, then sanctification. That's where we've been set apart. We've been cleansed. We have now been given a new relationship. We've been set apart to serve a Savior a God who loves us. And glorification. Well, we've been taken out of this world. We've been made a trophy of God's grace. And we have a great future to look forward to, an inheritance in heaven. All these terms and more that are all wrapped up in this passage, the key doctrines of salvation in the New Testament. Actually, someone has said the Isaiah 53 is the first gospel on which the other four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, are based. And we will see many times that they will quote this chapter. And we see in chapter 52, he begins with this, uh, that he tells us that the Redeemer, or that it is promised. And we saw that last week, back in verse 3, where he says, you've sold yourselves for nothing. You've sold yourselves to the slave market of sin that Paul brings out in Romans chapter 2 and 3. He says, you've been redeemed without money. You've been bought, bought with a price, but it wasn't money. It was the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we see that uh, this, the, 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 the Redeemer has been promised. And then we see then and, uh, uh, that, that it's going to be a strong hand, that, they, that our God reigns. We see that he never lost control. Everybody, well, many people think that the Lord came to earth and he didn't know why he was here and he died at the hands of cruel people not knowing it and uh, that he just, uh, he, but he was a good man. No, everything was by design. It was planned 700, it was planned back in the Garden of Eden. But 700 years before, we get the clearest picture of exactly the price that Jesus paid for on the cross. It's clearer in Isaiah 53 than it is throughout the Gospels of what the Lord Jesus Christ did for us on the cross. And so we see, yes, it was his mighty hand. In the fullness of time, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law. It was all under his control, even his birth as well as his death. He, didn't, he, did, he wasn't killed, although men think that it, they will describe him as being killed. No, he laid down his life for you and me. Father, into, my, into thy hands I commend my spirit. He was in control to the very end. So it was his power to save, his power over life and death that we see throughout. He was strong. My God reigns, and your God does too, if he's the Lord Jesus Christ. But then we saw in 
In fact, we'll begin reading in verse 13 of chapter 52, where we see what we call the, we saw the exalted sufferer, or we see also the idea of this contrast or this contradiction, this, uh, this divine contradiction that we have here. How can he be, and this was the thing that really confused John the Baptist and others, how can you be this conquering king and one who's going to rule over the nations and yet being a suffering servant? They could not understand that because they did not understand that the Lord Jesus was coming first as a servant to redeem us of sin, but he's coming again to rule and to reign. Are you going to be with him? Are we going to rule and reign with him? Or are you going to be cast off as one of those defeated ones that are going to spend an eternity without him in a place called hell? And so we see in chapter 52, verse 13, he says, Behold, my servant shall deal prudently. He shall be exalted and extolled and be very high. Just as many were astonished at you, so his vintage was marred more than any man in his form more than the sons of men. So shall he sprinkle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths at him. For what had not been told them, they shall see. And what they had not heard, they shall consider. Who has believed our report? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of a dry ground. He has no form or comeliness. And when we see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we did not esteem him. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And by his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before its shearers is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment. And who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off from the land of the living, from the transgressions of my people. He was stricken. And they, gave, and they made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death because he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief. When he made his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. <clears throat> He shall see the labor of his soul and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant shall justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul unto death. And he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bore the sins of many, and he made intercession for the transgressors. Father, we thank you for this great and precious word of God that you've given us. We thank you for the fact that you planned before in eternity past our redemption, not only our creation, but our fellowship with you forever through the shed blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you that we can come before your presence with singing and into your courts with praise. And we have the authority to be called children of God, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, 
but according to your mercy that you saved us and that you, by your grace, you lead us. Oh, Lord, we thank you for the great blessings that you have given us through the shed blood of the crucified one, the Lord Jesus Christ. We pray in his precious and holy name. Amen. The great reformer Martin Luther said that every Christian should memorize Isaiah 53. It is a beautiful picture of the redemption that we have and the price that was paid for that redemption through our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God. And we see that as <clears throat> in this passage that, uh, that um, we, he was esteemed. We looked at this past, last week. We looked at that divine contradiction of both uh, how could he be the suffering servant and yet the conquering king, the glorified one. But also we saw that in verses, 50, 51, 50, verses 1 through 3, 53, 1 through 3, that they were rejected. Now notice that he uses the pronouns of first person plural and first person possessive plural, we and our. And we see that he uses the verbs in past tense. So we must ask ourselves, who is speaking? Who is asking these questions? And we get that answer as we look over in Zechariah chapter 10, 12, verse 10, where he says, there's coming a day when Israel will be restored and the promises to Abraham will be fulfilled. Excuse me. And let's go back to the quote. That's my, that's my quote. But he says, and I will pour out my, on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the spirit of grace and supplication. Then they shall look on me whom they have pierced. So there's coming a day when the Lord is going to restore Israel. We know that's going to be during the time of Jacob's trouble, which is called the Great Tribulation. And there's going to be a rule and a reign of a thousand years with Jerusalem being the capital and uh, Israel being the <coughs> chosen people of God, the promises of Abraham. And he's going to rule for how long? A thousand years. And as you read that passage, and I would invite you to go back and read Zechariah chapter 7, you will see that on both sides of that quote that I gave you in verse 10, where he says that uh, they will turn back to me whom they have pierced. Of course, what's the picture of that? Was he pierced where? On his side, where? At the cross. And so this is going to be when they look back and they see what the Lord Jesus Christ did for them. And they're going to see how that their forefathers said, let his blood be upon us and upon our children. And they're going to see how that uh, they rejected him and he was despised and he was not esteemed. In fact, there's nobody. I mean, how could this man who lived in a nobody town in a, in a worthless town and uh, he worked with a bunch of fishermen who stunk and the best man he had, the richest man he had on there was a, was a tax collector and he was a crook. So how can this man be esteemed? How can this man be the savior of the world? He was despised and rejected and we esteemed him not. And so we see that they're looking back and say, oh, that was him. He said, a man of sorrows. And we saw last week, no, he wasn't pitying himself. But he looked at the world as a sheep, as sheep having no shepherd. And he pitied them. We saw many times, we looked last, last week at how that he wept with people. He disrupted funeral sessions. He cared for the sick. He healed people because he saw their distress. And he saw the marks of sin. Folks, you realize there was no sin, there was no sickness, no disease in the Garden of Eden until sin came along. You realize that uh, there was that if Adam had not eaten of that tree, he'd still be alive today. He was created forever. It was sin that marred. It was sin that brought death. David said, "Behold, I was conceived in sin, and my mother conceived uh, in sin. Did my mother conceive me? I was born in sin, and in, in sin did my mother conceive me." 
Well, that means that the very, the very fact at his conception, he was a sinner. So that's something we love to look at uh, ultrasounds and see that little heartbeat. And we say, oh, that's a baby. That is great. But that's a little sinner already at conception. Can you imagine? That tells us that children are children at conception. Does a lot to the abortion industry, doesn't it? But we see that, uh, that, that man is a sinner and he is in need of a savior. And when the savior came, the very Pharisees and the, the, the Sadducees, the religious leaders, the kings of the earth, they all rejected him. But when the Lord comes and the Lord saves Israel, they'll look back and say, oh, that was him. One of the saddest portions of book you'll ever read is the diary of Anne Frank when she's cooped up in that upstairs apartment for years. And she says, why does Mr. Hitler hate us? Why do people hate us? And you can look back at what their, their forefathers said, let his blood be upon us and upon our children. Oh, how sad it is that God used, that the devils can use, and Satan thought he was getting ahead at the cross, and he thought he was getting ahead with Hitler. But no, we have a strong God who's mighty to save. And even though God lets Satan have his will for a while, God is still mighty in salvation. And the promises that God made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are the, God, are the same promises that he has today. Whosoever will, may come. I know my Redeemer lives and you can come to the Lord Jesus and all the picture all the way from Adam and we're going to trace this how that the lamb was central in all the Old Testament we see in Adam and with uh, Cain and Abel the necessity of the lamb we see the provision of the lamb my God God uh, or my son God shall provide his lamb and whenever, with Isaac and with Abraham and Isaac. We'll see the character of the lamb where he's without blemish and without spot. We see the person of the lamb, that he is actually a person. Then we see, uh, we will saw also in the book of John, we'll see the identity of the lamb where we know that behold the lamb of God who takes away the what? The sins of the world. And then we'll see that Ethiopian eunuch. He is reading the very passage that we read this morning. And Philip comes along and he names him and he says, that's Jesus, the Lamb of God. And so we see worthy is the Lamb that was slain. And here we have that beautiful picture, the process of what went through. And what the redeemed Israel will say one day, they look back and say, we missed him. But we are now saved when we mourn and you know it's going to be like that in heaven the bible tells us when we get to heaven god will wipe away all of our tears i think there's going to be some crying in heaven over the missed opportunities we had to serve him there are going to be people in hell that we didn't reach because we were too neglectful of him and so yes there's going to be mourning but there's going to be great joy and god will have to wipe away our tears one day in his great forgetfulness in our, as we would serve him. But now he says, but righteousness now is offered to all who believe. And it's been true like that ever since. In fact, if you go back to that uh, passage in Romans chapter four, Paul uses Abraham to tell us that Abraham was saved not by money and not by works, but he was saved by faith. And Abraham was saved the same way you and I are saved today. He was looking forward to, re, to the Redeemer. We look back at the Redeemer to know the Lord Jesus Christ came to save that which is lost. And so as we look at this, we see now that it goes on and he goes from the we to the our. And of course, this is true with all of us. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Why do we have griefs and sorrows? Because of sin. Why do we have sickness and death? Why do we have war? Why was the first person born on earth a murderer? Because of sin. 
Why do we have confusion on earth today? Because of sin. Because when man sinned, it threw, it corrupted all creation. Romans chapter 8 tells us the whole creation groans until now. The lion started eating the lamb and the snake started biting and poisoning the people. And here we see that he said he was, he was, a, he was he carried our sorrows and we saw that as he carried, he was a man of sorrows. Not that he was sorry for himself, but he came to the earth and he looked at people and he looked at them going back and forth. Go to the mall one day. And I think if the Lord goes to the mall or to any location today and he sees people going back and forth, he would look at them as sheep having no shepherd. Oh, they can run to and fro, ever learning, but never coming to the knowledge of the truth. And they don't know even what they, they don't even know what makes them unhappy. And the things that they try to be happy with are the things that brings their destruction. Oh, we live in a cruel, confused world today. He was, we notice he says, yet we esteem him stricken, smitten of God. When we put him on the cross, we thought we were doing God a favor. We called him a blasphemer. He was the one, he wasn't a Pharisee, he wasn't a Sadducee. He was a factory reject. And we thought that whenever, because of his big boast, when we put him on the cross, or at least we had the Romans put him on the cross, then we were doing God a favor. He was despised and rejected. He was smitten of God. We thought that God smote him. He saved himself, let him save others. Or let it, he saved others, let him save himself. They looked at him and they scorned him. They rejected him. He says, but he was wounded for our transgressions. Now, a wound is, in the Bible, is a good, open, old, bleeding wound. And there's two terms here that uh, are true throughout the Bible. He says, he was bruised for our iniquity. Now, a bruise is something internal. Iniquity is the word that comes from a twist our twisted thinking. So he was wounded for our, act, our outward acts, our sin of Cain raising and slaying his brother. He was wounded for our transgressions, but he was bruised for our twisted thinking. And so we see that our thoughts and our and our bad view of God and our rebellion against him are the things that God doesn't only have to straighten out our acts. Oh, if I get saved and I won't do this and I won't do that. No, God wants to change your, your entire think, thought structure. If any man be in Christ, he is a whole new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things become new. Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is a good and acceptable will of God. And so we see that he was, God has to straighten out our thinking. He has to turn us from darkness to light. In him is light. There's no darkness at all. And if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, not war with one another. And the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. It's the savior of the world that is the hope of the world. Folks, we could have all the, uh, we could have a 100% conservative government and kick all the liberals out and get, and folks, if we, but, if, but if we don't turn back to God, we'll have just as bad a government as we have today. Because it's not the politics that's destroying this country. It's people turning away from a God who loves them. And the very foundation that this world was born on or this nation was born has been totally rejected. No wonder we're falling apart because sin is prevalent and being promoted and God is allowing the destruction of this country through sin, not politics. Every time I start really rooting for, and I've got, you know that I hardly ever mention a uh, politician by name because every time I do, they disappoint me or they'll say something that just whatever because they're just people. They're not our savior. 
I voted for a congressman that here, when I first got here, I thought he was a great guy, a military veteran and everything else, and he's one of the worst guys in Washington today. In fact, he sold himself out, and now he's on the television, ranting against everything I believe in. So, you know, there again, politics is it going to save us. It makes me cringe whenever somebody wants to deify Donald Trump or George Bush or Bill Clinton or any of the rest of them. They're all just men or women. And so we see that God is not going to save us by our politics. It'll be by his stripes we are healed. By the scourging marks. And by the way, that a lot of people have used that. Notice these are, are suffering redeemer. And that I've given you on, in your notes the outline pretty much. He says, surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Um, <clears throat> and when, uh, you know, of course, we saw that when uh, that, uh, he, he cast out demons and so forth. And when people came, he healed the sick. And that, uh, that might be fulfilled. And here we see in Matthew chapter 8, verse 16, the quote of Isaiah 53, where he says, he himself took our infirmities and bore our sicknesses. And of course, it was the Lord. That was not man. Now, God used man to show that it was his working. But folks, I do not have the power to heal the sick. And redemption isn't healing of the body. It's the healing of the soul. And we must... Make a difference for that. Oh, we have today all people raising big crowds. You just come and God will heal you. Folks, if God heals your body and lets you live another 20 years, you can still die and go to hell and spend eternity there. Oh, just come to church and just let Jesus. And he'll solve your marriages. He'll make you a better ball player. You'll run faster, jump higher. You'll have a new car. Uh, let go and let God. All these things. And folks, really, I have seen that happen in church. I've seen people get off drugs and live for God. And now they have wonderful lives. And that God has blessed them materially as well as their family. I've seen that. But it wasn't because of anything they did as far as that was salvation. No, that was a byproduct of salvation. God changed their thinking and he healed their soul. And as a result, things became new. And they started seeing the newness of God. Has everybody that's ever, there been one in my ministry ever been like, no, there's certain people that's been out there and they were hurting physically the day they were saved and they're still hurting if they're not dead yet. And yet, I praise the Lord, though, they're with their Father in heaven. And one day I'm going to see him again. Still remember old Herbert Downing. We were working up on the church uh, eve and uh, we we're trying to repaint. And that old Alabama sun was hitting down. And he was, we were up there and we thought we'd pull all the nails out of the fascia board, but we had left one in. And so he pulled the board off and that thing slapped him back in the hand. And, and, just, and I could just see his face turn purple. And I never will forget old Herbert. He said, right then, it'll feel good when it quits hurting. <laughs> it'll feel good when it quits hurting. Well, Herbert's in heaven today. And it, imagine it feels pretty good because it's quit hurting. Well, folks, uh, that's our promise. But God doesn't promise that he's going to take care. God wants to heal your soul. And whatever he does after that is a byproduct of it. But there again, don't be afraid of a person who can kill your body, as the Lord says. Be afraid of the person who can destroy you both body and soul. And so he was healed. And thus, by his stripes, we are healed. He straightens out our iniquities. He turns, he makes the crooked places straight, not only in the roads of the path of life, but in the paths of our mind. And he makes all things new. And so we see by his stripes, we are healed. He is the healer of the soul. And so we see he was wounded for our transgressions. And I gave you the, the um, definitions, transgressions, outward acts, iniquities, twisted thinking that causes out, outward acts. And so we see that God straightens out both mind and 
affections as we seek to serve him. Oh, if I get saved and I'm not going to do this, I'm not going to do that. Well, you get saved and allow God to change your mind and he'll change your want to her. When we love that chapter where God says that, uh, <clears throat> he says, delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Oh, that means I get everything I want, according to the radio preachers or television preachers. Oh, you just get saved and God will give you the delights. No, you better go back and read that again. God will give you the delights of your heart. He will change your want to her to make you want to delight what he wants to delight in. He'll make you love your, your wife again. He'll make you care for your children again. He'll make you hate the things that he hates. God can straighten out the soul. And God can straighten out the iniquities of the mind when he saves the soul. And he heals the person of their sin. And he gives them life eternal. And so we see that by his stripes we are healed. Now, just to bear that in mind, let's see what Isaiah thinks about sickness. He's not talking about physical sickness. Turn with me, if you want to, back to Isaiah chapter 1. I'll keep your finger there in 53, chapter 53. But this is what Isaiah thinks of as sickness. Isaiah chapter 1 and verse 5. Why should you be stricken again? Talking to Israel. You will revolt more and more. So the more I do for you, the more I, the more I spank you, the more that you just turn against me. The whole head is sick. That's a great way of saying you're sick in the head. <laughs> God is saying that to him. You're sick in the head. And folks, we got a lot of people that are sick in the head today, don't we? He says, the whole head is sick. The whole heart faints from the sole of the foot, even to the head. Folks, from the head to toe, you're sick. That's pretty sick, isn't it? He says, there's no soundness in it, but wounds and bruises and putrefying sores. They have not been closed nor bound up nor soothed with ointment. You have not been healed. You haven't even wanted to be healed. And as a result, you are miserable from head to foot. The more you do to alleviate the pain, the more that you just shift it to something else. And how sad it is to see that Oh, don't give me that religion. I'm going to live my life the way I want to. Well, then you go into all these shrinks. You go into all these different people that, are, that you expect. That you're saying, dear heavenly government, rather than dear heavenly father. And you're just getting farther and farther in debt. And you're just going down the, whole, the, the, down the road of perdition. Oh, don't tell me what to do. Uh, and you, here you are, all this goody-goody stuff, and you talk about righteousness and all that. Well, I've already got my three, uh, I've got my three sets of kids from three different parents and, or three different wives, and, uh, and don't tell me that I, and you're, all you're trying to do is impede my freedom. I got my baby mamas out there and all this. Don't tell me. I mean, I have my freedom to do what I want to do. And we see them miserable. Have you ever seen anybody that sold themselves? Just listen to some of these perverts. And all, everybody, perversion is anything outside the will of God. So folks, any, and when we talk about adultery, once you get away, we talked about Sunday school this morning, you get away from the husband-wife relationship, any relationship outside of that is perversion. That takes care of them all, doesn't it? And yet, today we are legislating perversions. And we expect, and we are saying that uh, perverse rights trump religious rights in America today. And you get in more trouble by condemning the sins of this world than you will by <laughs> just about, than you will by coming to church. I mean, just think about, or you get more in trouble by condemning the sins of the world and the perversions of this world than preaching that it's only one man, one wife. You know, I've got a granddaughter that uh, when she goes to, or they, when they go to school, uh, the kids there uh, are so perverse that they don't, nobody wants to be called straight. Whatever that straight means, I guess, today, normal. Uh, everybody's to be perverse. They don't use that word. In fact, I was reading uh, a high school teacher was teaching this past week uh, to be straight 
is to be is to be racist. These are the things being taught in our school, folks. So you can legislate unrighteousness. And so we see that uh, how sad it is that the uh, and by the way, folks, these are the intelligentsia. These are the people from Harvard and other places that are teaching our kids to go to hell. And they didn't, can't even tell you what a man or a woman is. They know what a man or a woman is, but they don't want you to know. They want you to deny the obvious. We're living in an Orwellian time where we listen to the government rather than to God. And so the government says, uh, or we say, that's impossible. The government says, no, we're the God of the impossible. You just believe it. No, we, I serve the God of the impossible and I believe him, not the government. And so we see that he was bruised for our iniquities. He was, by his stripes we are healed. And then notice he says, all we like sheep have gone astray. A sheep has no natural defenses. It has a very poor sense of direction. You never hear about a sheep in the wild. Is there any wild sheep out there? No. They've always had to have a shepherd because they are wide open to anything that wants to come along and eat them or destroy them. They must be protected. From the time of Cain and Abel, we know that uh, Abel was a shepherd. And God has protected his sheep through shepherds from creation. And of course, the we see that uh, all we like sheep have gone astray. We are just a bunch of, of people who have no protection from Satan. And we can be enslaved and destroyed by him. We have no sense of direction. We don't know at what we stumble. There's a way that seems right into man, but the ways that ends are up are the ways of death. And so we see we have turned everyone to our own way. And the Lord hath laid upon him Notice that word again, iniquity, our twisted thinking. He's laid on him the iniquity of us all. And so we see that we need someone to straighten us out. We need someone to be our shepherd. We need someone to lead us in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. We see we need someone who says, I am the way. I am reality, truth. And I am life, and you can have it more abundantly through me. And of course, no one comes to the Father except through that lamb. Now you say, wait a minute, you just said lamb and shepherd. How can he be lamb and shepherd? Because as the lamb, he came without wrinkle and without spot. He was the perfect man. He was born of a woman. He was sinless. And so he could identify with you and me. That's the reason he even identified in baptism through obedience to his father. But then he comes as shepherd because he's our God. He's the God man, is he not? So he's both lamb and shepherd. He's also the way and he's the door. He's everything I need. He's everything. That's basically what he's saying. Uh, it's like that in there. Whatever, is this in there? Yes, that's in there. Is he, your, is he your guide? Yes, that's the way. Is he your protection? Yes, that's the shepherd. Is he your protection? Yes, he's the gate. You know, whatever. He's whatever you need. My God shall supply all your needs according to his riches and whom? The Lamb, Jesus Christ. And so he is the one who straightens out our iniquities. He's the one who takes care of us. But we see that he says, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And of course, when the Lord as a shepherd, he looked and he saw them, they were weary and scattered like sheep having no shepherd. And he laid on him the iniquity of us all. And in 1 Corinthians 5, 21, he says, he made him to be sin. He made him to be iniquity. He made him to be a transgression for us all who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Paul's picking up from this passage. And he's telling us 
that justification, just if I had never sinned, not because I can myself, my good outweigh my bad. I don't even know how bad I am. The older I get, the more I realize, boy, I look back, it's like, ugh, have you ever gone down done that? And you have one of those cringeworthy moments. I can't believe it. Oh, man, I hope nobody ever knows that. But, you know, have you ever done that? Every once in a while I'll do it. My wife said, what are you talking about? I'm, no, I don't even want to talk about you. So you ever do that? Yes. And I didn't even realize it was bad at the time or whatever. And so here we have, the Lord says, he has laid on him the iniquity of us all. And I don't even know how bad I am. How can my good outweigh my bad? And by the way, if my good could outweigh my bad, and if I could do something to get to heaven outside of the blood of the lamb, would not the lamb have been a fool to come and pay such a price for me? Would not my religion, if I, my religion, if my church can get me to heaven, if my Catholic belief, and Catholic means everywhere, all any Christian is a, technically a Catholic in the term, not Roman Catholic, but you know, that's the word. But uh, if my Catholic beliefs could save me, no, or did my Catholic church save me? No. But only the blood of Jesus Christ. What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that washes white as snow. No other fount I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. So we see the price that he's paid. We see that he is the one. On him, he laid the iniquity of us all. Now that means that, my friend, your, your sins are paid for. God commended his love toward you, and that while you were yet sinners, Christ died for you. And yet, my friend, you can reject that, you can re reject that present. The wages of sin is death. That's determined by God. And death in the Bible is, is a separation from God into, and ultimately into the eternal hell. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through whom? Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, our Lord. That's the gospel. It's wrapped up right here. What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Now, <clears throat> we're already, if I preached another sermon, then I could take it an hour and 35 minutes, but I will spare you this morning. We will carry on. But we all, like sheep, <clears throat> have gone astray. The Lord has provided the sheep without blemish and without spot to die for our sins. But he rose again as a conquering king, and he's going to come back as a reigning lion. He's going to rule the world. He's going to rule the universe for eternity. And he's going to make a heaven, a new heaven and a new earth. And all the saints of God will be with him forever. Those who have accepted him. And folks, it's not that you will have eternal life. If you know the Lord Jesus Christ and you've accepted the Lamb of God as payment for your sin and as for the remission of your sins and you've turned and you want to follow him as your shepherd today, then it's not that you will have eternal life. It's that you have eternal life. This old body might die, but you're going to be with the Lord, absent from the body and a better life with the Lord so shall we ever be with the Lord. But at the same time, there's one passage, and of course, all through Isaiah, we call it the, the Gospel of Isaiah. But there's one passage that I wrote down on the bottom that I was thinking about five o'clock this morning. You know, I didn't finish that passage. We love this passage. It says, come now and let us reason together, saith the Lord. This is Isaiah 1, 18 and 19. Come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet. Notice when we reason with God, he doesn't move. He's got all the marbles. It's our sin, not his. It's not that I'll make a bargain with you. No, this is the way it is, guys. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. You know, we, one thing I uh, take exception 
with that little wordless book that we use sometimes for reading to children, how that uh, blood, and then of course they have the little, the colors of the book, is that there's only one mistake in it, and that is sin is not black. It's dark, but it's not black. And we think of sin as darkness and black, and that's one reason, so I'm not, uh, technically, it's not black, it's red. Notice the Bible tells us that though your sins be red like crimson, when the Lord looks through the, or God the Father looks through the blood of Jesus Christ, I like to use that. Back when I was a kid, they used to have these sunglasses. And if you got blue sunglasses, everything you looked at through those blue sunglasses was white. And if you looked at through the red sunglasses, everything that you looked at was white. Oh, excuse me, everything that was red turned white. So when the Lord, our Father, when God our Father looks through the blood of Jesus Christ, though our sins be as scarlet, When he sees the blood, he will pass over you. Isn't that great? All because of the Lamb of God. But there was one verse I was thinking about when I woke up this morning. I said, you know, one verse I left out. Because we do love to talk about salvation of God. We love to talk about what God can do. But we need to warn those who don't. And notice what Isaiah does in verse 20. But if you refuse and rebel... You shall be devoured by the sword, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Folks, that's God's word. He that hath the Son hath life. All one syllable words. He that hath not the Son of God hath not life. All one syllable words. Either you have it or you don't. Either you're on your way to heaven or you're on your way to hell. God has spoken. There's no compromise. What can wash away your sins? Nothing but the Lamb of God, which takes away the sins of the world. He came to die for you and me. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever, and that means you and me, I like to put my name there, that because Dan Lashley accepted him, I will not perish but have everlasting life. Does that make me better than that person out there on Skid Row? No, it's just by his grace that he saved me and the grace that I want that person on Skid Row to have just like I have. Oh, that God would use us to both bless and to warn a lost and dying world. There's a way that seems right unto man, but that's going to bring you death. But there's a way of eternal life and that's through Jesus Christ our Lord. He will solve your twisted thinking. He will take care of your sorrows. He will be the comfort of your soul as you come to him. Look unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. Oh, let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Oh, Lord, we pray that you would use the message, make the message clear and plain. May we sing it over and over again that Jesus will save sinful men. Oh, Lord, we pray that you would help us as a church to proclaim the gospel to a lost and dying Boone County in East Winnebago County and to a world that is confused and lost and angry because of their sin. Oh, may you you straighten out our twisted thinking, our violent acts. May we live for you and may you bring peace to this earth. Oh, Lord, we pray for your blessings upon us in Jesus' name. Amen.